Hello everybody and welcome back to Space Engine. Today we are going to go to a couple places, talk about whatever comes to mind, and I don't know, generally just space. <laughs> For the sake of space. Uh man, I've I have like so much to do, but I'm just like so not motivated tonight to actually work on anything. But I hate taking time off, so it's like I'll just do a video because that's doable. All right, first off, uh, we're gonna see if we can go to, aha, it is here, okay. This is the Comet of 44 BCE. It was a, uh, uh, yeah, there we go. Great Comet of 44 BCE, Caesar's Comet. It came by and terrorized humanity back in the day. I think I actually have been here before in a previous video, I can't remember. I've tried doing great comets before in the past. I, I think I went to Hail Bop at one point. I don't remember. Point is, comets are cool. Uh, where is the sun? There's the comet. Where, where's Sol? Ah, look at I'll do this. Um, Sol. Okay, Sol is right there. And it is currently 0 0.23 light years away. What does the map have to say about all this? Uh, let's actually click on to the comet. All right, where are we? Joe. Like we're away from. I don't even know what that. I'm. The, okay. Ah, there we go. No way. That would be Alpha Centauri. <laughs> and what's all this then? Oh, it's just other crap around the sun. Oh, there's the sun. Yeah, look at that. Just a uh, a population of icy bodies out here in the middle of nowhere. Oh right, the sun of course has a planet with life. Why wouldn't it? I mean, I'm currently living on said planet. <laughs> All right then, where else to go? Uh, somebody asked me if I could check out the uh, the Buddhist void. Buddhas, Buddhas, Buddhas. I don't actually know where it is. Um, I probably should have looked that up, shouldn't I? Oh, Mua Mua, let's go there again. Sure. Oh yeah. Um, oh crap! I should have looked this up. I don't actually know where it is. Um, oh my goodness. Okay. Ooh. It's very dark out here. Canopus. Yeah, I bet. Uh, ooh, Cirrus. And Capella. Everyone likes Capella. Where is Beetlejuice? No. Where is Soul? Sirius again. And back to Canopus. Hmm. I'm not very good at this. <laughs> and we're back to Capella. Ah, oh, that's just wonderful. That is wonderful. Um. Right. Now, uh, void wise, are we talking galactic voids, like or like interstellar voids or galactic voids? Because there are voids out here in the middle of nowhere. What are you? Ooh. And what are you? Ooh, the small Magellanic cloud and the large Magellanic cloud. I love the Magellanic clouds. But let's go back to the Milky Way because I I, I like the Milky Way. I know, because I live there. Uh, you know, this, the, the galaxy actually shown here isn't, oh, for God's sake, stop stop traveling, isn't really, like, 100% accurate. Uh, the central bar structure, I think a bit more pronounced on the Milky Way, as far as we know. And it's also warped. Like, it isn't a 
fully perfectly li uh, linear uh, plane like that it's actually kind of like warped in a weird wavy pattern the galaxy actually looks kind of like a pringle in terms of its shape so those really dumb pringle commercials are actually kind of right when they say the universe is pringle shaped it's like well the universe isn't but the gal uh, the milky way is kind of pringle shaped <laughs> so there you go pringles are fun all right, what is new in the world of science, technology, space, and everything fun? Uh, a lot of things, actually, but I'm trying to think of what is interesting right at this moment. Um, Ingenuity on Mars is still doing a good job. We need to send more, like helicopters to Mars, and balloons, and airplanes. Um, looking forward to Dragonfly going out to Titan. That's going to be fun. Osiris Rex is now going to go drop off its cargo on Earth and then head back out to Apophis, which is pretty cool. I remember back in the day when Ap people were like, Apophis is going to kill us all. Like, I remember being a kid watching TV. And, 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 and you always have, to have these doomsdayers that are like, oh yeah, Apophis is going to come and wipe out humanity. And I was always like, eh, I don't think so. And then you look into it, and it was like, oh, there's a very, very small chance that it might slam into Earth in the 2040s or something like that. And then, a little while later, they were like, oh yeah, no, we, we, we re-ran the numbers, there's actually no chance. And it's like, yeah, I figured. But people still still worry about that. It's like, you have to worry about Apophis, and it's like, you really don't. <laughs> you really don't. Ooh, life. But that's still kind of cool. Uh, I'm looking forward to seeing Apophis up close. All right, a mini Jupiter. Ah, the moons have life. Oh boy, subglacial. I mean, it makes sense. Most of the life in the in the galaxy is probably in ice shell moons. That is an opinion by me. That's not necessarily a uh, a fact you can take home. Although I'm not alone in thinking that. Like it's a fairly reasonable supposition based on the data we currently have and if you can find if you if you do find life in like Europa or Enceladus then it just makes it even more likely so to the point of confirmation because like if we can find microbial life in like just one ice shell moon in the solar system that's pretty great if we can find it in more than one then it's like yeah okay the galaxy is full of ice shell life probably mostly bacterial because microbes are easy to deal with um where are we three planets sure no i'm going go back to omoma my ooh you look like it could be a fun place to hang out boom uh it's a cold aquaria with very bright stars and it had a it had a friend in the, in the picture there's, oh, it has one friend, it has the moon. Oh, let's see here. Uh, age, uh, the atmosphere is quite complex and full of a lot of carbon compounds. Uh, atmospheric pressure is incredibly low, and it's incredibly cold. Hmm. It's tilt, 22, axial tilt, 65 degrees. What is its diameter? Uh, 0.77 that of Earth. And its mass is uh, 0.281 of Earth. Greenhouse effect. Probably not much of a greenhouse effect, honestly, considering its, uh, its temperature. Then again, Titan has a greenhouse effect. It's very, very small, but its atmosphere is thick enough that it does actually create a bit of a greenhouse effect. It also reflects a lot of light, too. So there's a bit of a cancel out there, but it's like its atmosphere is a touch, like really, really tiny uh, bit warmer than it would be otherwise. So technically that is greenhouse effect. Cool, sub-Neptunes. Sub-Neptunes are cool. A frigid mini Jupiter, no. In other news, um, things are going very well. It actually looks like I'm gonna be able to get my first dish for my radio telescope either late this month, early next month, and I am so looking forward to that because uh, once I have the first dish, I can um, finish up the like feed horn, slap that on, 
get it all set up with the uh, the radio, and then start actually like doing streams where I'm looking through my actual telescope instead of just my antenna that sits next to me, which kind of sucks. So I'm looking forward to that. That's gonna be a lot of fun. Again, the the, the initial like telescopes are just gonna be the single aperture, you know, six foot dish. Um, it won't be great because it'll be in my backyard, so there's gonna be some interference. But it's straight up, so it's you know it'll have a, a view of the sky. And once I can get the other two, uh, I'm gonna be relocating the whole thing over to probably the uh, observatory out of town on their grounds, and it'll live there for a while as a three dish array that's just constantly scanning for aliens because well somebody has to. So I'm looking forward to that. That's going to be a lot of fun. Beyond that, not much else is going on. I have my rockets I'm working on. Uh, I'm waiting for my... I'm waiting for the hard copy of my like short story collection to show up so I can give it the go-ahead. Because uh, it's, it's self-published, so I don't really trust that it's going to be you know perfect the first time. Ooh, aerial organic life. A red dwarf. Yeah, I was originally going to try to pitch the short story collection, but it's like new authors trying to do short story collections. It's like it, it, it doesn't happen. Like they, it's really hard to do. Actual like my, my my actual book I'm working on. Boom, that'll totally be much easier to pitch, and I'm going to do that. But the short stories, I was like, eh, I'll just help self publish them as a anthology or a collection, and let people either read them for free or buy a copy. I don't actually mind either. Either one's fine. Uh, this is kind of an interesting little planet. Not much detail. I mean, it's a bit of detail. But, eh, wavy clouds. I've actually been thinking recently, I want to get some gallium, because I, I, I've been kind of wanting to work on, like, a thermal collector, like a, uh, a thermal, like a solar thermal power plant setup but using something with a much higher or I think a much broader um, temperature range so it can store heat for longer because current you know solar thermal power plants use like various forms of molten salts that are heated up by the sun and they can stay hot enough for long enough that these plants will still produce energy even when the like after the sun goes down, like you can have them producing power for hours into the uh, into the evening and night, but then when they do eventually cool down, the power input drops, and then you have to wait for the sun to come back up. So I was thinking, it's like, what if you use something like a working fluid that could maintain its fluidity at a much higher temperature? And so I was thinking, what if you did like a um, a graphite container and you fill it with ga like liquid gallium? Because gallium has an incredibly wide um, liquid range, which is actually quite interesting. Its thermal properties probably aren't the best uh, as a thermal storage, but its its really wide liquid phase means you can heat it up a lot without it like boiling. So I was like, yeah, I wonder if you could like actually make a uh, thermal setup, like a solar thermal battery, essentially that it's heated up during the day to like unfathomably high temperatures and then it's just because like you have it in large enough bulk and it's hot enough it takes a long time for it to cool off you just heat exchange that's out slowly to uh, to make power and see if you can make it generate power for longer into the evening because why not that'd be kind of fun I also just like playing with gallium because gallium is really cool it's like non-toxic mercury although it's kind of a pain to clean up because it wets like everything <laughs> like you put it in glass it'll wet the glass and make it into a mirror uh, which is cool but if you you don't want to store it in glass so that's something else I've been kind of thinking about this is an interesting star well, there's a bit of there's a sun, well yeah actually it has sunspot activity running along like one hemisphere but not the other interesting Ba -da -ba. I'm actually right now, I'm speaking of clean energy, I'm currently printing off something. You can't hear it because the printer is currently residing in another room temporarily. But it's uh, printing off the, uh, bits, pits, bits and pieces, I'm tired, of um, 
a low flow water turbine I'm working on. Or I should say a small scale version of it. And it's going to be printing that off for the next week or two. And then I have to assemble it and make it work. Because the idea is you have like a low flow, oh we're back here, uh, a low flow run of river turbine that you can just sink into the riverbed. And it just generates power and, you know, constantly from just shallow water without disrupting uh, ecosystems. And then you can use that power for whatever you want. In my case, I'm going to see if I can produce hydrogen out of it, because why not? It's kind of fun. So that's currently working. The test model won't do very much. Like I'm, I'm, I am building a motor, like a generator for it. Like I'm, I'm making the generator myself out of uh, neodymium, ne neodymium magnets and wire, and such, because I couldn't be bothered to find a uh, a waterproof generator that had the correct geometry for my project. So I was like, I'll just make my own, like literally from scratch, because it doesn't have to produce a lot of power. It just has to produce enough that it proves the point that it works. Because the actual full scale one. It's going to be about four times the size, and it can use off-the-shelf uh, generators. It's a helical design. It's kind of cool. So, also looking forward to that. We'll see how that pans out. <laughs> Ugh, I need to finish up my last rocket. I have the rocket itself done. I need to sand it and get it all prepped. And then finish up the turbine, or the, uh, the rotor blades for the recovery system. Any planets here? Ooh, binaries. So we'll see how that goes. Uh, I love close binaries. They're just, they're so neat. Excuse me. Uh, that was a yawn. I didn't cut out um, audio. Warm, arid, subterra. Indeed it is. What are those impact basins? This planet did not well, I mean, it, it looks like it's fared all right. Oh, okay. But uh, it seems to have had a bit of a violent past. Then again, so did Earth. Uh, Earth had a very violent past, uh, geologically speaking. But look at that. It's like a s snowman impact crater formation. That's kind of cute. <laughs> uh, how about its moon? What are you like? Very interesting place. Wow, it's tiny. Uh, it's cold. It has no atmosphere. At least no, discern no, no discernible atmosphere. Um, whereas its parent body has a very, very thin atmosphere. Interesting. A little envelope of gas, hardly an atmosphere. I mean, like, Triton has an atmosphere, technically. But it's one of those things where it's like, when do you stop calling it an atmosphere and just call it a thin envelope? But, like, with Triton, it's incredibly thin atmosphere, although it's a, it's thin enough that if you were there, you wouldn't notice it at all. But it's just thick enough that it has weather. Like, there's actual clouds on Triton. They're very thin, nitrogenized clouds. They're really cool, but they do exist, so it's like, hmm... Uh, sure, let's go here. Or like Europa has a oxygen atmosphere, but it's a very, very thin envelope of oxygen produced from, I think, like peroxides and in the uh, being produced in the ice and then decomposing from because of the UV radiation, or the ice itself being dissociated by radiation from the radiation belt, just breaking off the oxygen and hydrogen. And the hydrogen goes away and the oxygen kind of stays. Is that a moon? Oh, that's one of its moons. Oh no. I've crashed into the planet. Where am I? I can't be on the surface of a gas giant. That's not how it works. Let's check out its moon. Ah, we've landed on the moon. Not our moon, mind you, but a moon. And a moon landing is a moon landing regardless what moon it's landed on. Oh my. Look at the surface. Very shiny. Probably mostly ice, to be perfectly honest. Actually, no. The temperature is 66 degrees. This wouldn't be ice. Why is it shiny, then? It shouldn't be shiny. 
But then again, ice in the solar system isn't shiny either. I mean, Europa's shiny, I suppose. Comets aren't shiny. They turn, like, black as coal because of, uh, just, like, organic compounds on their surface. Which, like, in Star Trek Enterprise, when they landed on the comet and it was white as snow, it's like, yeah, it's not accurate. <laughs> but it's Star Trek, and I don't, I don't care. I, I enjoy it. But anyways, that's 20 minutes. Um, this was a very unproductive episode. Whatever, it was kind of fun. Talked about solar energy and stuff. Uh, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. If you have ideas or places for me to go, let me know in the comments below or topics to talk about. I don't know. Watch my other videos too. They're kind of fun. Or don't. <laughs> anyways, thank you all for watching. I hope you enjoyed. And space.